closest joint work with Dan Ellistar, Jim Aspinus, uh, Ruddy Agelish Billy, and Jimmy Mizzou. Okay, so consensus problem is one of the most studied problems of theory of distributed computing. And in this problem, every process, P sub i has a <laughs> private input value um, x sub i. And each process that doesn't crash must output a value after taking a finite number of steps. That's called wait-free termination. And these values have to satisfy two properties. One is agreement, that all output values are the same. Okay, so they all agree, they come to consensus. And secondly, the, the output value of each process is the input value of some process. Uh, so you can't just sort of say, well, we'll always decide zero and hence we'll always agree no matter what our inputs are. Okay, in the boot camp, I proved that consensus is impossible in an asynchronous system of two or more processes that only communicate using reads and writes. Okay, and I used a valency argument, and I'm not going to go over it in great detail here. I'm um, just a configuration is uh, x univ univalent if um, all executions starting from configuration C output x, and it, the configuration C is bivalent if there are two executions starting from C that output different values here, zero and one. And the way the proof works. Um, is to prove two lemmas. The first is that every consensus algorithm has a bivalent initial configuration. And the second lemma is that from every bivalent configuration, there's a step that leads to a bivalent configuration. Now, in a bivalent <coughs> configuration, obviously no process can have terminated because then there can't be another execution. Uh, if a process is com um, terminated with value 0, there can't be some execution from that configuration where a process outputs 1 or the uh, protocol be incorrect. So putting these two lemmas together, this implies that there's an infinite execution consisting of only bivalent configurations, which violates weight freedom. Now we call such a proof extension-based, or at least informally. Okay. Um, I also, at the end of my uh, boot camp talk, talked about the case at agreement problem. And this is a generalization of consensus. The case k equals 1 is the consensus problem. And in this problem, um, we have the same inputs, and we still have wait-free termination. And similarly, validity, each, the output of each process is the input of some process. But we also have the um, agreement property is a little bit more relaxed. It says um, that there are at most k different values that are output. So we all, um, now, and the input values come from 0 to um, k instead of zero, 0 or 1. So what we, we want to agree on, there, um, all of the processes have to agree on um, most k different um, at most k different values. So they can't output all. It, there's no execution in which all k plus one values are output. Okay. Now, um, k-set agreement is also impossible in asynchronous systems with more than k processes that communicate using read and write registers. The first proofs of uh, this result came 10 years um, after the proof of the impossibility of consensus and including, done by a variety of authors, including Mike. Um, and um, they all use some form of topological arguments. And a national question is whether this result has an extension-based proof. Okay? The, um, those, the pr those proofs were very complicated. Okay. And uh, what I'm going to talk, show in this uh, talk is that um, the answer to that question is no. Um, it's not possible to get an extension-based proof of the impossibility of case and agreement. So the outline of my talk is as follows. Um, I'm going to start with the model of computation, which is going to seem a little strange, um, but it's because we need it for the second part, um, and that'll be a topological view of a protocol in this model. Um, then I'll define formally what I mean by an extension-based proof. And if we have time, I'll prove that there's no extension-based proof of the impossibility of k-set agreement for more than k processes. Obviously, if there's uh, k or less, fewer processes, that you can agree on k values. <laughs> OK. So the model we're going to use is the non-uniform iterated immediate snapshot model, which I'm not never going to say again, and I'll call it NIIS. Um, and this was introduced by Host and Chavit in uh, 1999. And in this model, there are n processes. Um, <coughs> I'll denote them p0 to pn minus 1. And the processes are going to communicate using an infinite sequence of snapshot objects. Um, and each snapshot object is going to have n components, which are all initially bottom. And in a snapshot object, process it, a process i can update component i. And it can also perform a scan, which gives the value, a vector returning the value of all um, the components atomically. 
Okay, so initially PI state is its input in any such in this model. And in its first step, PI updates component I of S1 with its state. So it just writes its state, that's all it's allowed to do. And in its next step, it, it does scan to get the values of all n components, and it updates its state to be the value of this vector that it gets back. And the next time it's allocated a step, um, PI updates component I of S2 with its state. Okay, and then the next time it's going to perform, next step it performs a scan um, to atomically, um, it, it scans all of S2 and gets all of the values that have been updated, all of the components that have been updated. Okay, and that becomes its new state. So it's a very boring kind of protocol, all <laughs> this one kind of protocol. Well, um, actually, we also have to talk about when processes terminate and output. And so there's a decision function delta that maps each um, process state um, to either an output value or the special symbol bottom. So if um, delta maps a pair consisting of process and its state to some value y which is not bottom, then we say that process pi outputs y in state s and terminates. Okay? And if delta maps um, that pair to bottom, this indicates that pi hasn't yet decided when it's in state s. Okay? Um, and a protocol for a task in the NIAS model is completely specified by its decision function delta. So essentially you can think of this as a full information protocol that you're just sort of, everything you know you write and then you see, read everything that you can, or you're allowed to read and then you update your state with that and when you uh, update stuff you, um, you update with everything you know, etc. And then the only thing we have to specify is um, you know, in your current state, with what you've seen all for your history, what you decide and when. Okay? So, um, all right. Um, now, the order in which processes take steps is decided by an adversarial scheduler. In other words, a, pro a protocol is correct only if it's correct uh, under any um, ordering. Um, now, the adversarial scheduler is actually going to work in a particular way it's going to repeatedly select a set of processes that are all poised to perform updates in the same snapshot object. Okay? Um, and then it'll schedule all of these updates and then schedule all of their next scans. Okay? So that's, and so for example, what we might, uh, this is an example of a schedule. So the uh, adversarial scheduler selected these three processes, uh, 0, 1, and 2. And so each of those is going to perform an update on um, the snapshot object S1. And then, they will see, um, and then they'll all perform scans. So they'll all see the, um, the inputs of one another. Okay, so P0, P1, and P2 will see the inputs of P0, P1, and P2. Uh, then um, the scheduler suppose, um, schedules the set P, uh, chooses the set P3, P6. Okay, so then they're, they're going to perform updates on a, um, the snapshot object S1. And um, then when they perform their scans, which is going to happen next, they'll not only see their values, but they'll also see the values of P0, P1, and P2. Okay? Now if we schedule P2, if, they, if P2 is scheduled next, then it's going to perform uh, an update on um, atomic snapshot S2. And so the result of that is only going to be its own, what it saw, um, its own value because nobody else, no other process has updated pro um, Snap, performed an update on snapshot object S2. And then finally, if P4 and P5 take steps, um, are scheduled that set, then they're going to perform updates on snapshot object 1, okay, because it's their, their first steps. Okay, and then they'll, do a, um, then they'll do a scan, and they'll see the first values written by P0, P1, P2, P3, P6, P4, and P5. Okay, so that it's a it's a little bit of a bizarre model, okay, Madhu. So, so they're never ever overwriting each other. No, it's just that what they see is asynchronous. Somehow. Yeah, it's asynchronous, <laughs> and so it's it, it's iterated because we do different. Um, the word uh, yeah, iterated is because you're doing it on different snapshot objects as you're going along. So it's just it's a very. I mean, it, one would never want to write programs in this model, but for analyzing lower bounds, um, it just because it has all this full information kind of stuff, it it just makes it easier to work with. Okay. Now, um, without loss of generality, the scheduler can schedule all operations on S1 before all any operation on S2, and all operations on S2 before any operations on S um, and S3. Basically, what we have is that um, we can, in particular, if we had this execution here, that's indistinguishable 
from this execution here where P4 and P5 perform their updates on S1 before process P2 performs its up update on S2. And this is because operations on different snapshot objects can commute with one another in the sense that it's indistinguishable to any process of which one of those two operations took place first. Okay, because there's, they're, they're comp each snapshot object is starting fresh. Um, okay, so we're going to have that nice normal form that will be useful for us. Okay. Um, in this model, a configuration consists of the state of each process and the contents of each snapshot object at some point in the schedule. Okay? And if a process is not terminated, but it's not subsequently scheduled, um, for example, um, then the process is considered to have crashed. And we see that a process is active if it is not terminated or crashed. Now, this mo the reason um, we can talk about such a weird, weird model is that Host and Shavit proved that this model is computationally equivalent to the standard asynchronous shared memory model, in which processes communicate by reading from and writing to shared registers. So we're back to what we really want to talk about. Um, it's just we have this a more convenient thing to work with. So it's much easier to use tools from combinatorial topology in this model. And when I say that it's equivalent, I mean that any task that can be solved by weight free protocol in one of these models can be solved by weight free protocol in the other. So that's what we mean that they're equivalent. So if I prove a lower bound in the NIS model, uh, an impossibility result in the NIIS model, I also have proved uh, an impossibility result in the asynchronous uh, shared memory model with uh, like processes communi communicating by reads and writes. OK, so that's our, um, that's our model. OK, now I have to give you a little bit about um, co uh, combinatorial topology. I'm not going to get, this is the slide about combinatorial topology. And so we don't really have to do too much more. OK, so a simplicial complex sigma is a collection of sets that's closed under subset, i.e. if x is a, a, an element of sigma and y is a subset of x, then y is an element of sigma. OK, and in topology, a set um, uh, in sigma is called a simplex. Okay. A set in a, um, a simplicial complex is called a simplex. And a simplex of size 1 is going to be called a vertex. And a simplex of size 2 is called an edge. OK? And so for example here, if we look at this triangle here, OK, um, that's, um, that's a simplex of size 3. And the edges in that triangle, this one here, that one here, and that one there, those are um, three different um, simplices of, or three different edges, three different simplices of size two. Okay. So um, we're going to, um, so we want to look at what, how do we represent a, um, a configuration in this topological view. So each vertex is going to represent a process and a state of that process. So the process is going to be denoted by a color. So we, in this picture, I have three different uh, processes, the black one, the white one, and the red one and the state of that process, uh, which is denoted by a label inside. So in this case, um, what I have is uh, here, this is uh, the red process, and um, it happens to be in state one. Okay. Um, now, a reachable configuration is represented by the set of vertices corresponding to the processes that have not crashed in C and the state of those processes in C. So I have a configuration, and I look at the state of each process in that configuration. Um, so the red process um, may have value 0, the uh, white process may have value 1, and the black process may have value 0, and that's a configuration. Okay, um, And that particular simplex, that set of size 3, denotes that. Um, that configuration. Okay, so it's a, just a, um, a convenient way of being able to talk about these things. Um, and the input complex represents all initial configurations. So this is part of the input complex for two set agreement amongst three processes. So e there are three processes, the white, the red, and the black. And each of them can have input value 0, 1, or 2. Um, now, so I have all the possible vertices of this. The problem is, is there are a lot more edges and a lot more sets of size three that I haven't shown. Okay, so they're just a, so you sort of this is a, um, a way of looking at algorithms in the NAIS model. Okay, so we haven't quite seen protocol yet. Okay, so now we want to look at a protocol. So the simplicial complex of a protocol is a set of all reachable configurations of the protocol in which no processes are active. So 
particularly looking at all the configura reachable configurations in which every process is either terminated or uh, crashed. Okay? Um, recall that a protocol is weight free if every process terminates after being scheduled a finite number of times. And the simplicial complex of a weight free protocol in the NIS model has a very special structure which we're going to use um, in our proofs. Okay, so I, now I have to describe that. In order to do that, I actually have to introduce a little bit more notation, a uh, little bit more from, um, from topology. Okay, so I want to talk about the chromatic subdivision of a simplex. Okay, so here's my, um, so here we have a simplex representing a configuration reached by a schedule in which every active process has been selected the same number of times. Okay, and um, let's consider all schedules from this configuration in which every active process is selected most once. So this is my, my original configuration and I want to, and I'm representing that by some, some triangle. And um, the, the set of resulting configurations, so all possible things I can get by scheduling um, um, each of the, pro the white, red, and black process each at most once, okay, um, is actually this. Okay, I can represent it that way. So let me, what's going on here? Okay, so if process um, X, if the white process um, is scheduled first by itself, okay, they're all poised on the same snapshot object, which is all initially um, empty, okay? So if it's scheduled all by itself first, then what, what it sees, it's just, it sees its own input value X, okay? Um, but now let's suppose that, um, X, Y, and uh, the, the white and the red and the black processes are all scheduled together, okay, as the f in the first this step. So what happens? Well, then they all write their, uh, update their components with X, Y, and Z, and when they do perform their scans, they, each of them they see X, Y, and Z, okay? Uh, and so these are sort of listing all the possible things that can happen um, when a process, when, the way the processes are scheduled. Okay, so we can have one process going first, a pair of processes being scheduled first, et cetera. Okay, and it has this very nice, this nice structure. Okay, that it, it's, uh, I don't want to draw it with more than three because then it's much more ugly, or at least harder for me to draw. Okay, so in this case, we haven't had, we have no processes that, that have crashed, okay, and that's what happens. Now, we also have um, a chromatic subdivision of a simplex when um, there's a process that's terminated. Okay, so here we have a process that's terminated, this white process is terminated, um, then um, th it's not going to take any more steps. So it, um, what's going to happen is it's always going to stay here. Okay, and so then we don't have, there's not going to be other things in here, and it, this process, the white process is never going to be write, writing to the snapshot object. Okay, so the red and, and black processes are never going to see anything um, that it writes. And so in particular, these are the only possible things that we have. So this is sort of the geometric view of what's happening, but you can do it, um, okay. Um, so the non-uniform chromatic subdivision of a simplicial complex um, is obtained by replacing every set in the simplicial complex by its chromatic subdivision. So we have all, of the simplicial complex consists of a bunch of these different triangles all connected together in weird ways. And what we do is chromatically subdivide each of them. It's non-uniform because sometimes there are thing, some vertices um, that have terminated. And so we do different things in those, in, those, uh, in those triangles than ones where all of them have, there's no process that's terminated. Okay, so that's what we do. All right, so we're gonna, um, Suppose, we're going to let Q0 be the input, input simplicial complex for a protocol in the NIS model. And we'll let Q1 be the non-uniform chromatic subdivision of Q0. Okay? And then Q1 will represent all configurations of the protocol reachable from an initial configuration by a schedule in which each active process is selected exactly once. Okay, so the, that, we have a nice view of what's happening. Okay, well, we can repeat this, okay? So for any R, um, we let QR plus one denote the non-uniform chromatic subdivision of QR. So we have Q0, Q1, Q2, Q, et cetera. And so QR plus one represents all configurations of the protocol reachable from a configuration in QR by schedule in which each active process is selected exactly once. And if we have a protocol in the NAIS model in which every process terminates after it's been selected at most R times, 
then QR is the simplicial complex of the protocol specified by this decision map delta. Okay, so we have a, for any member in the NAS model, a protocol is just specified by the decision map, otherwise everything is, is exactly the same. Um, because some processes can crash. So, I mean, like, is Q1, uh, so is Q1 scheduled zero? The is scheduled. Oh, I see. The only reason it is crashes. Yes, it crashes. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, okay. There are a couple of uh, properties of this, and I've put them on the board, and I'm not going to prove them because I clearly don't have time. But um, essentially, what we ha if we have um, some sort of path in here, okay, in um, in QR. Um, and um, we ha then if we want to go from here to here in QR plus one, the distance is going to expand. Okay? And the point is, well, if something is, has terminated, well, these, edges are, these blue edges here are going to be the same as here. But if in here, we ha these are between pairs of unterminated um, vertices okay, that haven't terminated, then when we do the chromatic subdivision, Okay, to get from here to here, it's going to take at least two. Okay, and similarly to get from here to here, well, in this case, it's much more than two, but it would take it, uh, at least two to get there. And so we, we have a, a lemma that basically says, um, if, I have, uh, if I can tell you that these two pieces of uh, disjoint pieces, subcomplexes of QR are far apart, and if I chromatically subdivide the whole thing, then they're going to be even farther apart. Okay. That's, that's what I want to say. OK, um, two, uh, two other lemmas. So suppose I have a simplex, some little triangle in QF. And F is the largest subcomplex of Q, which contains only vertices that are distance at most one from every vertex in F. OK, so with this little triangle, I look at the things that um, the vertices, their distance um, and most, including that, that the vert vertices of that simplex and all of the vertices, their distance at most one from every vertex in F. Okay, then I claim that there exists an input value A, okay, such that every vertex in F contains A. So there's some value that's seen by everybody in, in this um, little piece. Okay, it might be that if we're somehow in the middle of things, everybody's, everybody's seen every input value. But if we happen to be starting off, let's say where there's the all zero inputs, uh, all the inputs are zero, okay, then, well, there's certainly be everybody else seen zero and everything around it, everybody will see zero. So sort of that, um, Anyhow, we can prove that. And this basically says, well, if this is true for some sub complex, then when we do the subdivision, it remains true. OK, so I, don't ha I have about, I guess, about 10 minutes left or thereabouts. Um, and so it gives me a little bit of time to tell you what an extension-based proof is. OK, and so this is why it's in an, an, uh, an interact interactive complexity uh, workshop. Um, so an extension-based proof is represented as an interaction between a prover and a protocol, uh, which is defined by some map delta. Okay. Initially, the prover only knows the initial configurations of the protocol um, and where the state of each process is its input. And we'll let A1 denote the set of those um, configurations. And we're going to define A1 prime to be initialized to the empty set. And what we're going to allow, the do, allow is the prover can repeatedly query the protocol by choosing a configuration. Um, either one of the initial configurations, A1, or something that it, uh, it, that it gets, gets put into A1 prime, so things that it's, it's already explored. And it selects a, a set of processes in P that are all, perform, all re poised to perform an update of the same snapshot object in C. Okay, so it's sort of playing the role of the scheduler. It's saying, okay, here's a configuration that I know something about, and I want to see what happens when this set of processes, which are all poised to, to update the same snapshot object, are now going to be scheduled. And it doesn't have to be all of them, it just has to be a subset of them. Okay, so it could be just one process, or it could be two processes that are all, that are both poised to, um, to update snapshot object 17. Okay. Um, and then what the, um, the protocol has to respond with is the state, um, it has to respond with the state of each of those processes in the resulting configuration. So what happens when the, those processes take steps? Okay, so, um, well, the states are pretty, are well defined, okay, from the NIS pr protocol. This is full information, so it's just all the information there. But what we actually, what it has to do is actually t tell us what the value of the um, decision function is when we get there. Okay, so that's that's what it has to do. So that's it's, it's 
basically, by performing these queries, <coughs> the prover is getting information about the protocol, okay, or about the decision function delta. Okay? So once it does that, for each of the processes that took a step, um, the protocol tells us what the, whether the, um, the process has stopped or, um, or is still continuing. If it stopped, what, it, what value it outputs. Okay? That's what it's doing. And then what happens is that C prime, this new configuration we get, yeah, it gets added to A1 prime, and we can, the prover can then start from there, or can continue from, from C or some other initial configuration. So it just can ask these individual about sort of starting from some initial configurations, sort of get this tree of configurations that it's querying. It gets more and more information about them. Okay. And the prover wins, namely it shows that the protocol is incorrect. If the protocol responds inconsistently, so it says um, a process, um, it gives two different um, responses for delta for the same process in the same state. Um, it responds with uh, more than k different outputs in some configuration, um, or with an output a in a configuration which was obtained by a schedule from an initial configuration in which no process had a as its input, and this would violate um, validity. This is this one would violate the agreement property. Okay, but um, this is not very interesting. Okay, this model. So if the prover can only make a finite number of queries, uh, the protocol can always respond with bottom. Okay. And if the protocol, it then the only thing that the prover could do to show the protocol was, it, it's never found anything inconsistent, so it could just claim it was, was not weight free. But then the protocol could say, but you know, if you just asked one more query, uh, the, the processes would have stopped. Okay, so this isn't interesting. Um, so we have to add one more kind of query. So we're going to allow um, actually the pro prover to make a chain of queries such that um, C0, P0, C1, P1, et cetera, such that for each i greater than or equal zero, CI plus one is the configuration resulting from scheduling pro the set of processes PI uh, in configuration CI. And if the protocol um, does not eventually terminate all of the processes in the chain, okay, then the prover wins since the protocol is not weight free because it's constructed this infinite execution. Okay. But the protocol presumably is not going to do that. Um, so after making finitely many chains of queries without winning, the prover must choose a configuration. The, the prover sort of is, is, has sort of exhausted itself. And it must choose a configuration C in A, A1 prime and define A2 to be the set of all configurations um, that are essentially, that are the same as, as C, except that the, for processes that haven't taken any steps yet, we can give them any input. Okay, so that's what we're doing. If, it was, if P is an initial state, then we can change what initial value it has because it hasn't done anything yet. Um, but if it's not an initial state, we've sort of fixed it. Okay, and so basically this is just, it's, um, it's really um, committing to a schedule. So the prover is committing to a schedule and it'll only query about configurations that are reach reachable from extensions of that schedule. So that's where... Um, that's what we're doing. So that's really the notion of an extension. Okay. Um, and so the prover, uh, the protocol, so the prover wins if the protocol um, in the same way before, if it's inconsistent, has, is incorrect either of these two ways, or if it asks an infinite chain of queries, or if there's an infinite number of phases. Okay, so um, if it can keep on asking phases and keep on doing this, um, then we say that the prover wins. And the prover loses if at the end of some phase, um, there was nothing, it, it, didn't, it couldn't ask any more queries because all of the processes um, in that configuration had terminated. Okay, so that's an extension based proof. And now in the last few minutes, um, I'm going to give you a very, very high level, quick um, view of um, why there's no extension based proof for the insolvability of case at agreement. So to prove that case at agreement is unsolvable using an extension based proof, a prover must win against every protocol. Okay, that's, um, and so to show there's no extension based proof, what we're going to do is give an adversarial protocol that is adaptively constructing the map delta and show that every prover loses against this protocol. So it's a little bit of um, a flip of the usual adversary argument. So I'm going to construct this um, strategy. Initially, I'm just going to um, start with the input complex. And for um, I'm going to chromatically subdivide um, 
three times. And um, well, I guess I can so, chromatically subdivide four times. And in the first three times, after the in, in the first three times, everything's just going to be um, bottom. I'm not going to have any process stop because this is my protocol. I don't want things to stop too early. And in um, in Q4, if if I'm in a vertex that only has one one input value, hasn't seen anything else besides its own input value, then it's going to um, output the value a and terminate and output the value a. Other it's, um and We'll maintain a bunch of invariants, um, which are here, that I'm not going to have time to go through. Um, and essentially, what I'm going to do is I'm going, at each time there's a query, I'm going to specify more and more of um, what happens in delta. Okay? And the point is, I'm going to do it in such a this is just in this first particular, in the first phase. I'm going to do it in such a way that um, the the places where um, I have things that are defined, okay, so if there's outputs in various places, um, those are going to be far apart, okay? And what I can do, if they're not quite far enough apart, then I can do some additional chromatic subdivisions and they'll be even farther apart by the by this stuff here, okay? Um, you know, yeah, I don't really have much time, so we do this for phase one. And then at the end of phase one, oh, I have to show that during phase one, there's no infinite chain, okay? Because things go far enough apart, and I can define things in an appropriate way, which I wrote down there, but don't have time to talk about. Um, and then at the beginning of phase two, what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at what the extension is that the, um, the prover picked. And then I, what I'm going to do is basically find a value and um, not right there at that configuration, but a little bit farther out, okay, sort of the, to the extent of where the the um, the prover is explored so far. I'm going to go out that far, and then at that point, I'm going to define everything to have that. Basically, I'm going to fill in everything so everything is terminated. Just what, not in the entire um, complex, but just in the the things that are reachable from the the extension that the um, that the the prover fixed on. Okay, so it has an extension and I'm going to show within that extension I can always do that. Okay, um, and okay, and so basically I'm going to um, show that there are no infinite chains and the prover must eventually choose a configuration at the end of some phase in which um, everything, <laughs> every vertex is terminated and hence um, that means that the prover is going to lose. Okay, so um, we, we had a very, um, you know, it's possible to phrase a, the argument for impossibility of consensus as, um, as an extension-based proof. You have to work a little bit, but not too hard. But we can actually make it easier by extending um, the kinds of queries you support. So for example, we can extend our proof to allow a schedule starting from, um, to ask whether from a particular configuration, is there a schedule in which some process outputs A? Um, we can also ask um, the the prover can ask the um, the protocol um, to actually produce such a schedule, uh, a variety of other things, um, and so we can actually extend our result, uh, the uh, impossibility to include those kinds of queries as well. Um, and finally, we um, this is just I've talked about this in terms of proving impossibility results. We can also do with a little bit of tweaking. We can show that covering arguments, which are used to prove space complexity lower bounds, and I talked a little bit about that in the boot camp, that um, we can also use a similar approach to prove that the space lower, space lower bound for um, k-set agreement can't be proved using um, ex extension-based proofs, which are basically covering arguments. Hey, thank you very much. Any questions for Chris? <laughs> I, I know the terminology is a little daunting, but it's it's actually pretty. Um, if you, we kept it to a minimum, it's actually not that hard. If, and if anybody wants to talk to me about this at some other point or see some of the proof, I'm happy to show you. So thanks a lot. <laughs>